Hello, welcome to Global Eye. I'm Parikshit Lutra, and these are the key global headlines we are tracking this evening. After staying out of power for over a year, Benjamin Netanyahu makes a dramatic comeback as Israel's prime minister. After five elections in less than four years, Israel is likely to have a stable government for the first time since 2019. Massive protests by Pakistan's Tariqe Insaf supporters after former Prime Minister Imran Khan was attacked during a rally in Punjab province yesterday. The man suspected of shooting Khan remains in police custody. Imran Khan is currently being treated at a Lahore hospital and remains out of danger. German Chancellor Olaf Scholz meets Chinese President Xi Jinping, making him the first leader of the G7 nations to visit China since Xi got a third term in office. Reports say Scholz urged President Xi to use China's influence on Russia to end the war with Ukraine. Russian attacks leave 4.5 million Ukrainians without electricity. Ukraine President Zelensky accuses Vladimir Putin of energy terrorism, says the Ukrainian army continues to reclaim territory in eastern and southern regions. First up, India and UK have restarted talks to seal the long-awaited free trade agreement. Former Prime Minister Boris Johnson had earlier assured that both countries will be able to finalise an agreement by Diwali. So what has been the reason for this delay and what are the hurdles that both nations need to overcome? CNBC TV18 Sanjay Suri brings us a report on what's holding back the FTA. For Britain, this is above all about Scotch whisky. It wants higher quotas and reduced tariffs. India is the world's biggest market for whisky and the second biggest for Scotch whisky. It imported 136 million bottles of Scotch last year. Not enough for the Scots. The government in Britain has been pressing long and hard over this issue and as it turns out, successfully at least. In the earlier draft agreement, India is believed to have accepted British demands for uh, reduced tariffs and higher quotas on Scotch whisky. For India, the prime demand is over migration. It wants greater ease for its students and professionals to move into Britain and to work and live here. A negotiating position that some are finding inexplicable that India should offer to open up its markets to more and cheaper Scotch whisky and other British goods, and in return, Britain should take more and more of its best and brightest. Britain is resisting this Indian move. It is asking for a quid pro quo here that it will accept this demand on condition that India takes back more and more undocumented Indian migrants settled in Britain. Let me just say that both sides are uh, working sincerely uh, on the FTA. The issue also came up, as you are aware, during the phone conversation between Prime Minister and the new UK Prime Minister. And now fresh worry has arisen over the issue of generic drugs. A leaked draft of the earlier agreement in the FTA on this aspect of the deal shows that Britain is pushing for continuing patents for its pharma firms for a number of drugs. India, on the other hand, is the world's largest producer of generic drugs and millions of poor people around the world live on this. It's a lifeline for them. Medicine Sans Frontier has warned that any limitation on this production could be devastating for the health of millions around the world. When India is considering the proposals that the UK has put on the table, which seeks to expand more monopolies in India, what we are going to see is a more restrictive supply, not only for patients in India, but globally. And this is why the UK-India FTA is really a, a, a dangerous proposal that needs to be rejected outright by India. All right, let's also get you news from India's neighborhood now. Two of India's adversaries are cementing their relationship while India prepares for its Global leadership, China and Pakistan are huddling together to strategize their next moves. Pakistani Prime Minister Shabazz Sharif was among the first global leaders to visit China after she took over for an unprecedented third term. What's bringing the two countries together and what does it really mean for India's territorial integrity? Madhiha Mujawar looks at all the growing uh, alliance and uh, the impact on India. The last one year has seen China and Pakistan's relationship get more deeper than ever. 
While India expands its ties with the Western world, the country's immediate neighbours and stark rivals are strengthening their bond further. In a latest display of that growing friendship, Pakistan Prime Minister Shehbaz Sharif became the first foreign leader to visit China to congratulate Xi Jinping on his landmark victory for the third term. The two leaders agreed to deepen cooperation in areas of training, joint military exercises and military technology. Previously in March, Pakistan also exhibited China-made weapons and fighter jets in their National Day Parade. Geopolitical experts see this narrative as China's message to India. Pakistan and India do have this uh, uh, permanent sort of a problem. And uh, China, in that sense, continues to take advantage of this uh, problem vis-a-vis uh, -vis their the bilateral relations. So it tries to act in a way uh, that India continues to be part of because China essentially aims at India being confined to the South Asian region. Pakistan is in no position to negotiate at the moment. It is essentially uh, with the begging ball. They are going wherever they can because the economy is in a terrible shape and they need support. In the joint statement during Pakistan PM's visit to China, both countries reiterated their support on issues concerning their core interests, while China reaffirmed support to Pakistan's sovereignty, territorial integrity and security, Pakistan backed the One China policy and extended support on issues like Taiwan, South China Sea, Tibet and Hong Kong. China has been supportive of Pakistan in more ways than one, including helping Pakistan develop weapons of mass destruction. Pakistan acts as a Chinese proxy and China it does Pakistani bidding. Uh, and that is where uh, we have difficulties because, as I said, that uh, this puts, that uh, targets India and uh, is against Indian interests. The growing association is not restricted to just military support. China is funding numerous infrastructure projects in Pakistan under the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. The CPEC is a transport corridor that passes through Pakistan-occupied Kashmir. The two countries have now agreed to enhance the corridor to Afghanistan and this is seen as China's bid to expand its reach. India has raised its objections. The Ministry of External Affairs has said any projects in POK are illegal and any third country's involvement will directly infringe on India's sovereignty and territorial integrity. In Mumbai, Madiha Mujawar. All right, uh, let's uh, move on to Myanmar now. It's been nearly two years since the military there deposed the civilian leadership and took power. The army has cracked down violently on peaceful protests. Ethnic groups have taken arms against the military and there is no sign of negotiations towards a truce. Matthew Thomas reports on the unrest across Myanmar and its implications for India. 21 months since the military took power through a coup, civil war is raging in Myanmar. Last week, the military airstrikes on a concert held by a rebel faction led to the death of 80 civilians. All of them belonged to the minority Kachin ethnic group. Unfortunately, this is just one of the several acts of violence against citizens that's becoming a daily occurrence. More than 2,400 people have been killed and over 16,000 arrested since the coup according to local monitoring groups. We're seeing crimes against humanity and war crimes being committed on a, on a daily basis. We've also seen, for instance, attacks against schools and churches, uh, bombing campaigns. We've seen uh, targeted burning of uh, settlements uh, by the Myanmar military. This, however, hasn't stopped the protests. It all began on the 1st of February 2021. An exercise instructor inadvertently captured a military convoy reaching the parliament to arrest then-state councillor Aung San Suu Kyi. Alleging voter fraud and threat to national security, the military junta deposed the elected leaders and assumed power. Soon after the military took power, the National Unity Government began peaceful demonstrations. But after a violent crackdown by the military, the country's ethnic groups began to support armed resistance by providing funds and training. The Myanmar military, I think, is probably losing ground uh, to the, um, the opposition that they face across the country. Uh, but the Myanmar military, of course, is not going to concede that and they're not going to back down. Uh, so I expect that we're going to see, uh, uh, you know, significant uh, increases in rights abuses. 
Despite the escalating violence, peace talks are currently non-existent. The Myanmar army and the ethnic groups do not trust each other historically, and that continues. These groups believe that the military government will have to make concessions to even begin negotiations. Globally, the United Nations has outsourced resolution to the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, but there is no consensus in the 10-member body. It is a big problem here, and with ASEAN split because of ASEAN's rules, where uh, you know one state can exercise effective veto authority, uh, it becomes very difficult to do anything. Language of threats and coercion against this very proud nation and a very powerful institution, progress may not be uh, easily achieved. Experts say that Russian weapons used in Ukraine are also killing people in Myanmar. Russia is the primary weapon seller. Uh, and they're selling the weapons that are particularly important for the Myanmar junta, which is uh, helicopters, uh, jet planes, and things like that. With China openly backing Myanmar's military rulers, India is forced to walk the tightrope. The states of Mizoram and Manipur share a long border with Myanmar and even saw an influx of refugees when the military took power. India is uh, uh, very much uh, strongly advocating uh, the return of Myanmar to the earlier path of transition to democracy. Uh, at the same time, uh, being a realistic uh, practitioner of policy, uh, it is clear that uh, there is a government and uh, therefore uh, the idea is to keep uh, doing business with that government. As the civil war rages in Myanmar, people are bearing the brunt and there is no sign of peace or even talks to achieve some sort of truce. In Mumbai, Matthew Thomas. Right, uh, the world, of course, watching the uh, situation in Myanmar very closely. Let's uh, get you a big focus now. Benjamin Netanyahu has made a comeback as Prime Minister of Israel after his right-wing coalition won 64 out of 120 seats in the Neset. Netanyahu defeated the sitting Prime Minister Yair Lapid, his staunchest rival. The longest-serving Prime Minister Netanyahu will now head the most right-wing government in Israel's 74-year history. Let me go across to uh, Iran Edzion, non-resident scholar at Middle East Institute. Thank you very much for joining us, Iran. Uh, tell us what really worked in favor of Benjamin Netanyahu. How was he able to come to power with such a strong majority? Who was the kingmaker for him? Well, it's not really such a strong majority. If you look closely at the numbers, uh, a few thousand votes here and there would have made a tremendous difference because of the intricate composition of, of Israel's electoral system. It's, uh, it's obviously not like the American system, but the difference between the popular vote and the final outcome uh, is significant. However, he was able to do it, Netanyahu, first of all, because he is a master politician. As you said, he's been around for the longest time, uh, even more than Ben-Gurion. Um, he has been prime minister, not consecutively, but 16 years, which is obviously a huge number in Israeli terms, in every term maybe. And uh, he's uh, very savvy in the uh, art and practice of uh, political campaigns. So this is number one. Number two, as always, you know, one needs a, a particular combination of circumstances, including mistakes made by the other side, who failed to galvanize uh, as a uh, ruling coalition and to uh, do what is necessary in order to uh, win elections. Uh, the campaign that uh, Lapid ran was pretty poor. Uh, other parts of his uh, uh, ruling coalition uh, did also did not uh, perform very well in the campaign. And ultimately, they lost uh, uh, a whole uh, left-wing party called Meretz, which was in the Knesset for uh, decades. And it's the first time that it fell out because it failed to uh, cross the electoral threshold of 3.25%. It missed about 4,000 votes altogether in order to do it. So, uh, as I said, the combination of skill, luck and a particular moment in history because what is happening in Israel is not unlike the national, nationalistic populist wave which is sweeping across many countries uh, including countries like you know Hungary, Poland, uh, the US. We'll see what happens in, in the midterms but it looks like there's going to be a red wave there too.
So uh, Israel is not uh, an isolated okay. island. And Iran, represents, if I may ask you, uh, this is being called the most right-wing coalition in Israel's history. What will this mean for Benjamin Netanyahu's policies domestically and his foreign policy? Yeah, I think there's no question that this characterization is true. It is the uh, uh, most rightist, hard-right, extreme-right government we ever had. Uh, for the first time, there is a very significant party that sits in that coalition, which is openly racist, uh, comprises of, uh, of uh, bigots, some of them with uh, a dark history of uh, allegations and even uh, trials for accusations for support of Jewish terrorism, for uh, uh, racism against Arabs and so on. Um, many of them did not either chose not to serve in the IDF in the Israeli army, or were re even rejected by the F by by the IDF at the time because of their extreme views, as absurd as it sounds these days. And uh, some of them are going to be cabinet members in very sensitive positions. So it is an unprecedented phenomenon in our history, and uh, the uh, overall shift to the right that has happened in Israeli politics basically since uh, Yitzhak Rabin was murdered 27 years ago, uh, almost to the day, November 4. Um, and uh, this movement to the right is now culminating in the creation of the rightest ever Israeli government, comprising of uh, ultra-Orthodox, uh, ultra-nationalists, bigots, racists, and uh, led by Netanyahu and his Likud party, which uh, is now finding itself as mm. uh, more of a center-right or right-of-center uh, party surrounded by parties that are either more rightist or more ultra-Orthodox. Uh, Iran, when we're running out of time. State, I'll ask you sorry, one quick question about no, just, the corruption just, trial just, just, against Netanyahu. What happens to that now? How will he counter that? That's an important question that everybody's asking. Nobody obviously has the answer. He denied during the campaign when he was confronted with the question, what are you going to do about your trial? Will you try, if you're prime minister, will you try to somehow stop the procedures, annul the procedures, uh, do all sorts of tricks in order to, uh, to halt the process? He denied it. But uh, some of his partners openly said that they're going to do exactly that. So uh, we'll have to wait and see. There is obviously a huge question if such a procedure is even legal, possible, will it withstand scrutiny right. by Israel's Supreme Court? Uh, it's it's going to be an interesting uh, point to watch. All right. Thank you very much, Iran Itzian, for joining us here, giving us your view on the Israel election and significance of Benjamin Netanyahu coming back. We're going to take a short break, but coming up, we take a deep dive into the U.S. midterm elections and why the inner circle of Donald Trump may actually be planning for a 2024 election bid. A special conversation with Ali Wine, senior analyst at the Eurasia Group, coming up.